All right, so welcome to Math 140 Calculus 2. This is the fifth lecture. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about one of the most important results in all of mathematics. It's the fundamental theorem of calculus. You do not get a word like fundamental associated to you lightly. You know, this is not the, we want everyone to feel good. We want all the theorems to feel like they're equally important. No, when you see fundamental, this is something you need to know. So does anybody know any other fundamental theorems? There's a few other you should have seen by now. So you might have seen the fundamental theorem of algebra. If I give you a polynomial of degree two, how many roots does it have? So how many roots does a quadratic have? How, how do you find the roots of a quadratic? What do we use? So quadratic, yes, the quadratic formula. And it gives us you know, negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So if I give you a polynomial of degree 2 or quadratic, it has two roots. If I give you a polynomial of degree 1, you know, say 3x plus 7 equals 0, there's just one root. You know, 3x plus 7 equals 0, 3x equals negative 7, x equals negative 7 thirds. What if I give you a cubic degree 3 polynomial? How many roots does it have? Three. If I give you a polynomial of degree four, how many roots does it have? Four. Now, some of these roots could be the same. Can you give me a polynomial of degree four that has multiple roots, where the roots are not distinct? So what would be a polynomial that has multiple roots that are the same? All right, somebody give me a polynomial of degree four. Let's, let's start with something a little bit simpler. What's a polynomial of degree four? Talking about fundamental theorems. So can somebody give me a polynomial of degree four, a quadratic? So my pen is not working right now, which is interesting. So somebody give me a polynomial of degree one. Can somebody give me a polynomial of degree one. X plus one, another polynomial of degree one. X plus two. All right, three x. Okay, we've got plenty of polynomials of degree one. Can somebody give me a polynomial of degree two? X squared minus four. And what will be the roots of x squared minus four? Plus two and negative two. Uh, it's not working right now, so I'm going to try to go the old way. I still there plus maybe is it okay that it doesn't have a a square term, a quadratic term, sure. And so if I wanted a quartic, that would be something of degree four. So could you give me a polynomial degree four that has repeated roots, that has the same root more than once? So a general quadratic, a general quartic, looks like, say, a x. Those are 
two different notations. What's nice about the second notation? Well, as we add higher and higher degrees, it's going to be more difficult if I keep using letters like A, B, and C. You know, even if you are a Dr. Seuss fan and have read On Beyond Zebra, where he adds more letters to the alphabet, you'll eventually we run out. And so eventually we have trouble. So the question is, what's a good notation? You really want to think about what are good notations. And here, by using these subscripts, we help ourselves. Oh, OK, the term in front of the x to the fourth, we'll call that a sub four. The term in front of x cubed, we'll call that a sub three. And in a general polynomial, you can factor and say a is the first root. polynomial degree four, I can factor it like this. That's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Every polynomial has four roots. So can you give me an example of a polynomial that has repeated roots? The roots R1, R2, R3, R4 are not distinct. They actually have things in common. So do you think it's easier to try to find a polynomial with repeated roots to look at something in the form ax to the fourth plus bx cubed plus cx squared, or to start off with a x minus r1, x minus r2, x minus r3, x minus r4? Which way do you think is going to be easier to construct a polynomial with repeated roots? The second one. So can you give me some choices of the r's where I'll have repeated roots, we'll have the same root more than once? So you have to, does everybody understand what we're looking for? I want a polynomial which has different, which does not have different roots. Maybe I want all the roots to be the same. That might be the easiest case. So can you give me a polynomial where all the roots are the same? I'm sorry? So I want a quartic, but I want all the roots to be the same. So what would be an example of a quartic where all the roots are the same? So one would be all the roots are zero. So The simplest example will be the simplest example of a polynomial where all the roots are the same, just x to the fourth. Polynomial where two roots are the same and then the other two roots are completely different. So which roots would you want to take to be the same? Make things as easy as possible for yourself, right? Make two of the roots zero. Now we need two other roots. What should we take for R3? Let's take R3 to be one. Natural choices. Two is one of the natural choices. There's another natural choice. Negative one. Which do you think is a better choice, two or negative one? Negative one, it keeps the size of the root small. So if we do that, that's this 
screen that I will get a minus one. x minus one times x plus one, that's just x squared minus one. So this will give us the project ax plus one b minus ax squared. That would be an example of a project where two of the roots are the same and two of the roots are different from each other and from that you know, repeated root. So when you're trying to construct things, depending on what you want to do, different forms could be more useful than others. So later, when we get to you know, the real help, when we get to you know, integration with partial fractions, we will actually go back to vertex forms of parabolas. And you don't have to write a parabola as ax squared plus bx plus c. There's other ways to write it. You can write it in terms of the coordinates of the vertex. Depending on what problem you're doing, sometimes one approach is more useful than another. And so if I'm trying to talk about where the roots are, well, the situation where I have everything factored, that's really useful. That's much easier to work with than the other one. Now, unfortunately, if I am frequently dealing with something, I don't initially get it in the factored form. I get it in the form with the A's and the B's and the C's. And then the question is, how can we find the roots? Well, if it's a polynomial of degree one, you know, three X minus seven, that's not too hard to solve for X. Three X minus seven equals zero, three X equals seven, X equals seven thirds. If I give you a quadratic, what do we use again? Quadratic formula, quadratic formula is not so bad. If I give you a cubic, I showed you the cubic formula, right? And the cubic formula was not great, but it exists. And I showed you there's a formula for the quartic. It's even worse, but it exists. There's no formula once you go to degree five and higher. So this is worth noting. You know, we spent all of this time learning how to differentiate functions and how to find antiderivatives or integrals. But there's a lot of other processes which we just can't do. We can't do in closed form. I can't write down in a simple formula what the roots are going to be as a function of the coefficients of the polynomial. So we have to sometimes do numerical techniques to find them. Did we talk at all about numerical techniques to find roots? Not yet. So later in the semester, we might circle back and talk a little bit about Newton's method and divide and conquer and ways to try to find where is the polynomial of the energy. But the fundamental theme of algebra Includes repeated roots. So if I give you x to the fourth, x to the fourth does have four roots. The four roots are zero, 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 and zero. So you have to be very careful how you count. Okay, so what I want to do today is I want to just review some of the key results from your calc one that were used to prove the fundamental theorem of calculus, and then just talk a little bit about what's it like to you know, actually do the fundamental theorem of calculus by hand. So this was a very theoretical lecture. This is one of the most intense lectures of the semester, if not the most intense. So you know, let's get it out of the way at the start. I like to have the start of the semester much more intense than the end of the semester. So when you have other professors who only realize, well, we've only done half the work of the course in two weeks or left, and they pick up the course load, we'll be in a place where we're actually cutting back on the course load. We're gonna be a little bit top heavy. So, the fundamental theorem of calculus is a significant proof. A lot of math classes do not prove it. It is worth seeing the proof. This doesn't mean you have to understand it line by line. This doesn't mean you have to be able to reproduce it on an exam. But it's important to know why is something true. The other thing is the general philosophy of, can I test this? You know, is this result reasonable? If ever somebody gives you a comment or a claim, is there a simple way you can check and see, is this reasonable? And one of the things we did in the lecture is we said, well, let's look at certain shapes where we can find the area. And unfortunately, the first two shapes that we tried were, anybody remember? Rectangle and triangle. And if you think about it, you know, going home and telling your parents, so what did you do in college today? Well, you know, we found the area of a rectangle. Really? And the triangle. 
And how much is tuition again? You know, th this is what you're doing. You're finding areas of rectangles and triangles? No. Why are we doing rectangles and triangles? Because we can test those cases with a fundamental theorem of calculus. We know what those are independently. To find the area under a parabola is a lot more work. You know, the area under a line, you're either a straight line, so it's a rectangle you know, with slope zero, or a line at an angle, so it's a real honest to goodness triangle. Not a big deal, but it's at least some test of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The parabola was the first real test. You know, that should be something that you did not know what the area under a parabola was before doing calculus. And then we saw how to do this using something called proof by induction. And we broke it up into these upper sums and these lower sums, and we took the limits and we saw that it converged. All right. Then one of the things I do want to talk a little bit today is about something called Simpson's rule. That sometimes there's more than one way to do a calculation, and the goal is to see what is the fastest way we can find to do a calculation. Do we want something where we're actually concerned about how well is it going to go? All right, let's see if the pen is working yet. Sorry. Okay. So I am not going to go into detail over here. This is the intermediate value theorem. So the intermediate value theorem basically says that if you have a continuous function on an interval, and if it's say five at one point and eight at another point, it has to hit all values in between. You can't skip anything. And so we Always have a left. Draw some coordinate axes. Here's my x axis. Here's my y axis. And let's imagine now I have some. Let's imagine I have some function. So please, good enough that people can see. I have my function over here. If I take some point over here and call this point A, and I take another point over here and I call this B, and what the intermediate value theorem says is that anything that is between f of A, which is over here, and f of B, which is over here, you give me any y value in this range there's going to be some x value that hits it. So for example, if I, oops. So for example, if I choose some point over here, it comes down and it tells me here is a value of x that works. Does it say anything about what happens outside this range from f of a to f of b? No, it's possible. And in fact, over here, we see we actually do hit a couple of values that are larger than f of b. We do hit a couple of values that are smaller than f of a. There are some values, in fact, that we'll even hit multiple times. You know, this y value we hit twice. All it tells us is that, for instance, if you start 10 miles from home and end 30 miles from home, at some point you were 25 miles from home and 26 miles from home and 17 miles from home. These pictures. Okay. okay. Any questions on the intermediate value? So the next the 
the mean value of sin. Here is the mean value of sin. Should not take that one to just transfer to the screen here, but okay. So here is the mean value of sin. And what it basically says is, imagine you have a function that's continuous and differentiable. Then you look at f of b minus f of a, you can interpret that as how far you've traveled from b to from in time a to b. I start at f of a, I end at f of b, the distance traveled is f of b minus f of a. The time elapsed is b minus a. Well, if I look at f of b minus f of a over b minus a, that's my average speed in the interval. And then f prime is my instantaneous speed out of point. And so what this is saying is that if your function is continuous and differentiable, at some point in time, you must be traveling the average speed. So there's a couple, there's a couple of your pages of proofs here. It turns out you can reduce this to what's called Rolle's theorem, which is the very special case when you start and end at zero. It turns out if you can prove it just in that case, you can prove it in general. If you want a little bit of a challenge, now I urge you to try to do that case. And so yeah, the exercise, and here's a little bit of a sketch as to how you would try to do that, is you basically look at a related function, you prove Rolle's theorem holds for this related function, and that implies it for the original function. This is a good exercise to try to do. There's no need to do it, but it illustrates a wonderful math technique. You can often reduce something that's very complicated to something that's simple. If I can do this special case, when I start and end at the same point, which I might as well assume is zero, it turns out that's enough to get the general case. It just makes the notation a little bit easier. The advanced thing basically comes down to just changing your perspective, and that's what this does here. This is the more rigorous proof. I'm going to just have it flash up here just for a moment, just so that it's been seen. But I'm going to really, for the most part, skip that. Instead, I'm going to just talk to you about the proof. And again, let's do something physical. Let's imagine you're driving. And let's say you start off at some point, you drive and you end at another. And let's say your average speed is 50 miles per hour. Okay. We're trying to find some point in time where we're traveling at the average speed. If we start off at the average speed, we found our time. Plus, right? If we end at the average speed, we found out, right? So let's go back to the shit out of the way. So What time would you choose if you started 50 miles per hour? When would you be going the average speed? At zero. So if we start at the average speed, there's no problem. If we end at the average speed, no problem. So you might as well assume we don't start and end at the average speed. What if we were always traveling above 50 miles per hour? Why is it not possible? Yeah, so wait a minute. What did you say? It can't be your average if you're. It can't be your average if you're hitting. I could be zero for half the time and 100 for half the time, and my average would be 50. So it's, it has to be low at some point. Okay. Well, why can't my average, why can't my speed always be greater than 50 miles per hour? You're close. Right. 
if you're always are traveling above 50 miles per hour, how does your average get to below 50 miles per hour? And this is the question of then, how rigorously do you want to prove this? You know, I flashed the slide of the advanced map speak, or I think we can just accept among friends. If I'm always traveling above 50 miles per hour, my average is greater than 50 miles per hour. You know, my notion of average is the following. If you give me some numbers in a range, my average is going to be somewhere between the lowest and the highest, inclusive, you know, because they could all be the same value. But my average can't be lower than the lowest value. What if speed is always going to be impossible? So this is an example where you know if I do one argument, the other argument is done very similar. So there's two possibilities. We know you can't always be greater than 50, and we know you can't always be less than 50. There's two possibilities. Okay, good. So one possibility is and what would happen in that case? So if you start off below 50 and end above 50, what kicks in? What theorem kicks in and tells us that you must have hit 50? Intermediate value theorem. Tab, I think it's no longer It's the second case, and it's essentially mathematic that you always have. Inclusive, exclusive. You must cover every possibility. There can't be anything that's left over. So one case is that at some point we're below 50 and at another point we're above 50. What's the other case? Yes. Miles math looks like my users. We leave this as an exercise to the reader. We leave this to the reader. If you're always traveling at 50 miles per hour, can you find a time when you're traveling at 50 miles per hour? Yes. In fact, you cannot find a time where you're not traveling at 50 miles per hour. Right? So in this case, it's actually not that bad. Okay, so this would be the proof of the mean value theorem. So that is the mean value theorem. So, just talk a little bit about what we're about to do. So, what we're going to try to do is we want to find the area under a curve. And what I do is I can choose, you know, here's my A, here's my B, and I chop things up into little pieces. And on each piece, what we can do is we can try to find, you know, rectangles to approximate the area. So this would be for the lowest sum. And I could also do between for the upper sum. And the idea is that the more divisions you have, the less error there's going to be between the true area and your lower approximation and your upper approximation. We actually did this 
uh, you know, very early in the semester when we looked at these formulas for pi, where we you know, tried to find you know, what is pi by chopping up the circle or approximating the circle with regular n gons, a square, an octagon, and we kept doubling the number of sides. And we did the inscribed, which was always smaller in area, and the circumscribed, which was always larger in area, and the approach to common value. And so what we're going to do here in calculus is we're going to split things up and we're going to calculate the upper sum and the lower sum on each interval. And that gives us a bound. And if we have a nice bound like this, then we know that the true area is somewhere in between. And in the limit, if the upper and the lower sums converge to the same value, so what we'll have is we'll have our lower see our upper value and this is Lower bound. Have something like this. The lower bound is less equal to the true area, is less equal to the upper bound. And if in the limit as n goes to infinity, if we happen to be lucky enough that we know that the lower and the upper both converge to the same number. What's the only number that they could both converge if they converge to the same value? It has to converge to the true area. Imagine they converge to something less than the true area. Well, the upper bound is never smaller than the true area. So if they converge to something less than the true area, that's impossible. And by a similar argument, you know that if it converges to something greater than the true area, there's a problem. So the only thing that they can converge to is the true area. And so what we get is, So it's actually not that hard to prove for most nice functions that you will actually converge to a common value. That's not so difficult. The difficulty is how do you compute that true area? How do you compute what it converges to? There, was a, there were many reasons why I started the semester the way I did. A lot of it was I had no choice. This was the COVID response. We had to be remote. And I wanted to change a little bit how I was going to lecture if I would have been but it was very useful to see that formula for pi. We have square roots of square roots of square roots of two. And as you go to the next level, you get the square root of the largest term before. That should not look like something that's converging to pi. Right? I have been doing mathematics longer than you've been alive. I have been a card carrying member of the American Mathematical Society longer than you've been alive. When I look at that, I don't see pi. So when you have a form like this, how do you detect what it converges to? The real content of the fundamental theorem of calculus is that this is converging to the antiderivative at b minus the antiderivative at a. That there's a really nice way to calculate this. So the fundamental theorem of calculus That is the content of the fundamental thing of calculus. That we can find areas under curves of nice functions if we are fortunate enough to be able to compute the antiderivative. This is not the weakest condition of what nice. To math graduates who would play games um, to see just what is the weakest set of conditions you can do. I doubt any of you have ever heard of it, but in the audience, have any of you ever heard of the TV show Name That Tune? 
Oh, excellent. Someone has heard of it. You have cultural extra credit. What is the purpose of name that tutor? You could probably get this right without even knowing the game show. To name the song. And how does it work? Right. And the question is, how many notes do you need to get the song? I can name that song in 15,000 notes. You know, most songs don't even have 15,000 notes. And so it becomes a question of what is the fewest number of notes you need? And you know, there are certain things that are, I think, so famous that if I were to play them, uh, it's pretty easy to play. Gamble, this is this pretty much. So you can try to simulate, come up with what's the weakest set of conditions you need in order to prove something. And so the fewer conditions you need. Beethoven's better, right? Could you have done it with just one note? I think a lot of people could actually do it with one note. To some extent, it's also, well, what song do you think they're going to choose? Yeah, they're probably not going to choose you know, the theme song to an obscure French film from 1903, right? You know, it's going to be something somewhat reasonable. And so, hearing just the first song, so if somebody wants to load up something famous for next class, you know, and test us. You know, everybody can bring in one. We can do this before class begins and just see how many notes we need. Four notes for Beethoven, clearly enough for your know, Beethoven's fifth. Different ones require different number of notes. This is very similar to what we're doing over here. It's you know, all comes down to what is the weakest set of conditions we need to prove the fundamental theorem of progress. I actually don't need the function to be continuous and differentiable with bounded derivative, but it makes the proof a lot easier. How many people have seen the TV show Friends? All right, so I was actually dating and getting engaged and marrying my wife around the same time that Monica and Chandler were doing it. So those episodes were borderline either funny or just too true to be funny. But every episode but two of Friends starts as a title, The One With. And the big way of proving the fundamental theorem of capitalists using this is to just repeatedly hit it with the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem, the mean value theorem. Why do we care so much about the mean value theorem? It allows us to approximate our function very well. So just save this. The mean value theorem, just to restate it, allows us to approximate f of b if we move the f of a to the other side. As f of b is basically f of a, where you started, plus f prime of c, your instantaneous speed, times b minus a, how far you've traveled. So one of the reasons the mean value theorem is so useful is it allows us to approximate a function using information about what's going on at that point. If I know where I am, and I know how fast I'm moving, if there's no acceleration, if my speed is constant, this is a perfect approximation. And so we expect the mean value theorem to actually do a pretty good job of approximating the function. The difference here, and this is worth mentioning, is when we use the mean value theorem, it just tells us there is some point C where this is true. What would you like to know? Where is C? Imagine you leave Williams and you become a political consultant and you are hired in uh, 2052 to advise someone's presidential campaign. And you tell them, we've done extensive work and we have been able to determine that you do have a path to win the presidency. What's your client going to ask you? What's the path? You go, well, 
I got my degree in mathematics from Williams. It's a theoretical. Sorry? It's a theoretical. There's a way for you to do it. I have absolutely no idea what it is. It's an existence proof. So a lot of times existence proofs are not really that valuable. It's sometimes just enough to know that something exists and that we can frequently then do something with it. The fundamental theorem of capitalism is a wonderful example. We don't need to know where that point C is. We just need to know that it exists. We can use it to balance certain things. We can then take the limit. If you're a political consultant, they're going to want to know more than it exists. They're going to want to know what is it. But in math over here, all we needed for the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus was that there was some point. OK, now that we have that point, then the question is, what can we do with it? And so we talked about the fundamental theorem of calculus. We talked about how we find these upper sums and these lower sums. One of the difficulties with the upper sum and the lower sum approach is you have to find on each interval, where is the function smallest? Where is the function largest? This is not easy in general. If your function is what's called monotonic, which means it's either never going down or never going up, essentially it's always increasing, always decreasing. It's not quite the same as always increasing because it could increase, be constant for a while, and then increase again. That's why it's better to say non decreasing and non increasing. But if your function is never decreasing, say, well, we know that on each interval, if it's never increasing, where's the lowest point going to be? At the beginning, and where's the largest point going to be? At the end. So if we have a function that's non decreasing, it's actually very easy to find the upper and the lower sums. Just take the left end points for the lower, take the right end points for the upper. If the function was non increasing, it would just be the opposite. In general, however, the function is going to be oscillating, it's going to be very high. And so there's a lot of things you can do. It turns out, and we saw this in the proof, you can just take any sequence of points and it's going to work. So good choices to take is the left end point, the right end point, the middle. Sometimes, sometimes what people do is they take the average of the value of the left and right end point. And then there's something else you can do called Simpson's rule. And Simpson's rule is not really covered that much. Um, I actually was working with a student uh, this summer and Mathematica was not giving the right answer for some double integrals. And so we actually had to encode Simpson's rule to evaluate this. This is a better formula, it's more accurate. So what we're doing is we still have the points x0, x1, x2, x3, and so on, but we're weighting the points differently. We're weighting them with the first and the last points get a one, and then all the odd indices get a four and all the other even indices get a two. We have a one third outside. So what we're really doing is, you know, essentially think of it as, okay, screw the first and the last points. You know, as n goes to infinity, those two points don't really matter. Every other point gets either a four or a two. What's the average of four and two? Three. And oh, good, that's a number between four and two. This goes with our intuition of averages which we talked about earlier. Notice that we're dividing by three outside. What we're really doing is we're weighting some of the points a little bit more than others. And it turns out that Simpson's rule does a lot better job calculating areas than just using the upper bound, lower bounds from the endpoints. And the reason is Simpson's rule, rather than trying to find you know, a really good rectangle or trapezoid, what it does is it actually finds a really good parabola. And it uses the area under a parabola. So just you know, drawing a quick picture, you know, if I give you my function f of x, uh, then I find the parabola that goes through the two endpoints. And then I find the area under the parabola. And as a rule of thumb, that does a better job, typically, than just trying to approximate this with rectangles or trapezoids. It turns out that you can do a lot with stuff like this. I actually maintain a riddles page, and I've just posted a riddle which is related to parabolas. But I don't really want to go into much detail. If anybody's interested, you can email me. And so what I did is I wrote some computer code this morning. And you know, the first half on the left is actually the code that just computes things. And the stuff on the right is just you're printing things out in nice ways. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the area. I'm going to approximate the area several different ways. What do you think left does?
Yeah, it uses the left endpoint, right? Right endpoint, average uses the average of the two, and Simpsons uses Simpsons method. This stuff over here basically is just telling us if n is one of the even indices, you multiply by two. If it's one of the odd indices, you multiply by two. And the whole point of this is I'm doing a lot of calculations. And you know, right now, I'm not expecting you to be able to write code like this. If you want to know how to write code like this by the end of the semester, I'm happy to work on that. We sometimes take for granted the powers of computers. So I am old enough that you know, the first computer I really programmed on, we had the memory expansion that had 16 kilobytes of memory. Do you have a question? No. If you want to, if you want to, absolutely. It's a really good skill to have to be able to write simple code. This is essentially just using you know, a for statement and it's just counting and it's just adding things together. It's one of the most valuable things you can learn how to do is to write code. Because then rather than you having to do things, you can have the computer do things for you. And computers can do a tremendous number of things. And so what I was able to get the computer to do here is to calculate all these different approximations. And I can choose the, the different function I'm going to use. So I input my starting left endpoint, my right endpoint, how many divisions I want. And I input whatever function I wanted to calculate this with. Now, when I'm calculating things, I can actually do things a little bit efficiently. If I'm using the left endpoint all the time, the left endpoint for one interval is actually the right endpoint for the interval before. So you don't want to calculate the same thing again and again and again. So if you're clever, what you do is you compute something once and then you store that value. So I'm doing a trick where I have the current value and the new value, and I keep flipping them. It just allows the code to run a little bit faster. And so you know, here's the function I chose to integrate the cosine of pi x squared. So this is a function where it is not easy to write down the antiderivative. There are some techniques from complex analysis but I think they only work if we're integrating from zero to infinity, All right? And this function is not monotone increasing, it's not monotone decreasing. So this is an honest to goodness. So who do you think is gonna work best? Left, right, average, Simpson. Probably Simpson, you know, given that I said it's using a parabola, and if it wasn't, why would I go through all this trouble putting in these extra weights if it's not doing anything? But it's not that much harder to code. You know, rather than just taking the value, I just put in it's two if it's an even index, and it's four if it's an odd index. That's a really easy change in the line of code. And let's look at the accuracy. So I did three different tests. I did 10 divisions, 100 divisions, and 1,000 divisions. So I calculated the left, the average, the right, Simpsons, and the true answer. And so when you look at these, you know, it's sometimes hard to tell just how good something is. So sometimes it's better to look at the errors. And so we can see, you know, it's not so great um, initially, but I'm only using 10 divisions. At 100 divisions, all of them are looking pretty good. At 1,000 divisions, they're all looking pretty good. But look at how much better Simpsons is. You always want to try to figure out what is the correct scale to study something. So for instance, the more divisions I take, the smaller step size I have. So I expect my error to be getting smaller because I have more pieces and the function can't fluctuate as much. So to some extent, of course, the error is gonna go down. I wanna figure out what's the correct scale to study how much it's going down. And so what you can do, delta X is that gap between left and right endpoints. And so I can look at delta X to the first power, second power, third power, fourth power, fifth power. And I can compare my error to the size of the deltas. So for instance, when I have 100 points, delta x is 0.01, delta x squared is 0 0.001, delta x cubed is 10 to the negative 6. When I look at these errors, this error here is roughly of size maybe 10 to the 4, 10 to the negative 4. So maybe this error is on the order of somewhere between delta x and delta x squared. It's better than delta x, it's better than 0.01 when I'm using the average, but it's not, and it's around the size of this. So maybe it's around delta x squared. When I look at Simpson, that's 10 to the negative seven, that's somewhere between delta x cubed, delta x to the four, 
over here when I have uh, a thousand points, Simpsons is 10 to the negative 11, and my L is around 10 to the negative 9, 10 to the negative 12. So it just gives you a sense of the size. All right, so this is a good place to stop for today. If you haven't hit it in the homework, please do so. Have a great day.